Good morning and welcome back to another vlog. Uh, it is Friday morning and I am currently getting ready for work. So I work full days Monday and Friday by myself at the urgent care. So it's usually pretty busy, especially right now. Things have been picking up with sick people. <laughs> so at first I have to obviously get dressed and then I've got to take my boys to where they're going. And then I'm off to work for the day and I'm hoping to be able to take you along for some of the day and share some more urgent care case studies with you guys. And that's it, that's all she wrote. I'm gonna go put some scrub pants on. I am going to wear this t-shirt actually that I'm wearing right now because it's just, it's Friday, right? I can wear a t-shirt. And then we're gonna head out. All right, so I have just dropped off Jackson to his Noni's house and Caleb is at school. I got him there on time. Any day that I get both boys to school on time and still make it to work on time is a miracle. Truly a miracle. And it is so stunning outside right now. It's like 75, sunny, blue skies, birds chirping. And my office has like one measly window. A little depressing. Can you hear the birds chirping? It is so pretty out. Look at the sun. Hopefully it's a good sign that there was plenty of parking in the parking lot. So maybe it's not too busy. Fingers crossed. Okay, so before diving into the patient care case studies, just for an idea, I'll generally present to you how I write my quick HPI in the urgent care, and then I'll tell you, of course, what I saw on exam, and then ultimately my plan of care. So for the first case study, the HPI was, patient is a 78-year-old female on daily eloquence for history of AFib, presents today after a mechanical trip and fall that occurred 30 minutes prior to arrival. Patient states that she was stepping up the first cement porch stair and tripped, catching herself with her hands outstretched in front of her. Patient denies loss of consciousness and does not remember hitting her head. Denies chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, weakness, changes in vision, vomiting, and states her only pain is to a skin abrasion on her right palm. Denies swelling or deformity, range of motion, sensation, and neurovascular status intact. On exam, a patient appeared to have some amnesia surrounding the event, which of course is an alarming symptom. Patient did not remember hitting her head. However, on physical exam, they, she did have an abrasion to the left side of her forehead with some mild bruising and swelling. There was another abrasion to the patient's top of the scalp. There was no swelling or bruising there, but there was an obvious uh, new abrasion, and patient did not recall hitting her head. So, of course, this is a concerning factor, um, of course, as well as her age and the fact that she's on daily eloquence. And so for all of these concerning factors, of course, I sent this patient to the ER to have a CT done of her head. She did decline an ambulance and instead went by private auto, However, of course, her her daughter was driving, and you know they agreed to take her to the nearest ER. Um, so I included here for you guys the indications for a CT of the head, and so this is really good to have you know uh, tucked away somewhere. So a Glasgow coma scale less than 15. Um, so if you suspect an open or depressed skull fracture, for example, symptoms of that would be a, a scalp laceration or a hematoma, bony step off of the skull, so that would be something that you'd palpate. 
um, sign of basilar skull fracture, so hemotympanum, so that's blood behind the tympanic membrane, uh, periorbital bruising, so bruising around the eyes, retroauricular bruising, so they actually have bruising behind the ear, and then otorrhea or rhinorrhea, so that's draining from the nose or the ears. Um, two or more episodes of vomiting, of course, new neurological deficits, uh, use of an anticoagulant medic medication, seizure surrounding the event, retrograde amnesia of 30 minutes or longer before the traumatic head injury, and then a potential for high impact injury. So examples of that would be a pedestrian versus an automobile accident, fall from three feet or more, or fall down five stairs or more. And then also things such as intoxication, headache, or abnormal behavior are also going to be red flags that warrant getting a CT of the head. Patient is a 24-year-old female without pertinent medical history, presents to the clinic today with a laceration to the lateral aspect of the fourth digit on her right hand. She was gardening and states that she cut her finger on a metal fence. Patient stopped the bleeding with pressure and cleaned the wound prior to arrival with soap and water. She reports very minimal pain and has not taken any medications at home. She denies swelling, deformity, and any other injuries and unknown last tetanus. So on exam, the patient had an approximate 2.5 centimeter superficial laceration to the lateral aspect of the fourth digit. Uh, the wound appeared clean, range of motion, sensation, and neurovascular status remained intact, and there did not appear to be any, any uh, tendon involvement. So four sutures were placed using 5-O-Ethylon, and the patient was updated on their tetanus vaccine and then given instructions to return to the clinic or to their primary care for suture removal in 10 to 14 days. They were also given instructions on proper suture wound care and then symptoms to look out for that would warrant a further evaluation. I actually did do a video in the past, on one of the All About videos, that was completely dedicated to managing um, a laceration in the outpatient setting. It's super helpful for these kinds of patients, of course. Uh, I'll make sure to link that video down below, but this is actually a screenshot from that video. So if nothing else, this chart is super, super helpful in regards to uh, choosing suture sizes and length of time uh, before removing the sutures. Um, and this was combined from information I had taken from the practice guidelines for family nurse practitioners and then, of course, up to date. So as I mentioned previously, my workflow, of course, is to see two patients and then go sit down and chart on those two patients what I need to finish before they are able to be discharged home before seeing any more patients. And honestly, I've learned to tailor that, of course, with the patient acuity and how many, how many tasks are happening at once. But sometimes if I know that a patient is going to be there for a little bit longer, like they're doing perhaps a duonub treatment or they're getting x-rays, then I'll even see three before sitting down to chart because I know I have that additional time for like pending tests and whatnot. All right, so patient number three. Patient is a 77-year-old male with a history of high cholesterol and diabetes, presents today with a fever of 101 and productive cough for two days. He has used over-the-counter Tylenol and Mucinex DM for symptom relief and fever relief. He denies all other symptoms, including sore throat, chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and body aches. He denies any known sick contacts, and he is COVID vaccinated. So this patient did test positive for COVID and because of his risk factors for worsening disease and he had a symptom onset less than five days, he was of course eligible for Paxlovid. So Paxlovid is not recommended for patients with a GFR less than 30 or for those with a severe hepatic disease. However, for those patients with a moderate reduction in kidney function or a GFR of 30 to 59, then they are able to take the Paxlovid However, the dose is just simply reduced. Typically, the dose is 300 milligrams of nermatrelvir, which that actually comes in two 100 mil 150 milligram tabs, and then one 100 milligram tab of ritonavir, and that's taken twice a day for five days. So the general dose has a total tablet count of 30 tabs. Uh, for patients with reduced kidney function, their recommended dose is only 150 milligrams of the nermatrelvir, so that's only one tab, and then there's still the same 100 milligrams for the ritonavir. 
and this reduced dosing, the total dispensed tabs is going to be a total of 20 tabs. So in order to make sure that their kidney function was in shape, I ordered a CMP in the office, and that was to get his BUN and creatinine to help assess for kidney function. Um, and there's actually an equation that you can do to calculate a person's GFR, but you can also just Google a GFR calculator, and just by typing in GFR calculator into Google, you'll, there'll be multiple ones that'll pop up. And then what you'll do is you'll type in your patient's creatinine, age, and gender, and it will give you your patient's calculated GFR. And then of course you use that number determining if that Paxlovid is an okay medication, a safe medication for them. Uh, this patient did have a creatinine of 1.4 and therefore a GFR of 53. So this shows a moderate decrease in kidney function and therefore I gave this patient the reduced dose of Paxlovid. Also, another important point in regards to prescribing Paxlovid, of course, is to be aware of the drug interactions because there are a lot of them. So I always use Hippocrates, the free app on my phone, I paid nothing, and under contraindications for Paxlovid, you can actually find a long list of medications which are contraindicated um, with combining in Paxlovid or ones that you should um, be cautionary of. So this patient here was currently taking Crestor, which is a statin, and then metformin for diabetes. So Paxlovid and statins, they should not be taken together, and it's actually recommended that you DC the statin at least 12 hours prior to starting Paxlovid, and then have the patient continue to hold their statin for five days after completing the treatment. This is to avoid, of course, potentially causing an increased statin level, and this, of course, can cause many negative side effects, such as uh, rhabdo, myelosis. So I definitely encourage you to use the medication uh, when appropriate, of course, but also to make sure that you're double checking your patient's medications to make sure that there are no uh, contraindications or interactions to look out for. So this slide I just put here, so indications for Paxlovid, I mean this is kind of backpedaling here, but uh, symptomatic COVID positive non-pregnant patients that are 12 years or older weighing 40 kilograms or more in the outpatient setting within five days of symptom onset and one or more risk factors for worsening disease. So those are kind of the qualifying things that you're looking for. But what's a risk factor for worsening disease? So this was a list provided on up to date, of course, um, and it gives you of various examples of risk factors for worsening disease, and this is not even all-inclusive. Um, but as you can see, there are just so many things here that could work as a criteria to prescribe your patients Paxlovid, one being a BMI of 25 or higher. I mean, that's not hard to beat. And then physical inactivity, I suppose that's subjective, So, <laughs> but there's just lots of um, variables here to take into account when determining if your patient's gonna benefit from using Paxlovid. All right, so patient number four, he is a 46 year old male with pertinent medical history of diabetes and he presents to the clinic with an intensely periodic rash on bilateral arms, thighs, and the left side of his neck for four days. He states that he was doing yard work yesterday and he believes he came into contact with poison ivy. Patient states that he tried hydrocortisone cream, uh, the Xanafel, poison, ivy wash, Benadryl, and calamine without relief of his symptoms. He denies fever, swelling, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and body aches. So on exam, the patient has an erythematous vesicular rash to the bilateral forearms, hands, thighs, and left side of his neck. Due to, of course, the extent of the rash and also the lack of response from the over-the-counter treatments that the patient tried, I did prescribe this patient a tapered dose pack of prednisone, and I'll show that here. So this was taken directly from up to date. I use the this schedule here, so 40 milligrams for five days, 20 milligrams for five days, and then 10 milligrams for five days. Um, and then I, I t also always make sure to educate the patient on how poison IV is actually spread. So it's through the plant's oil, the uro -shul -shul? I don't know, that causes the rash. Uh, so it's really important just to make sure that they're washing any clothes or linen that comes in contact with the plant. All right, so I have 20 minutes left of my shift and I have like 10 charts to finish. So that's what I'm going to try and bust out as fast as I possibly can right now. It's been really busy, so I've fallen a little bit behind in my charting. 
but if I can, I really like to not bring any home, so I'm gonna try and finish it now. Let's Ooh, this is really cool. All right, charging. Mm -hmm. Find my keys. Oh my god, you guys, it is so beautiful out here that I'm like in heaven. I cannot wait to roll my windows down, listen to some music on the drive home. I just finished all 25 of my charts before I left. I can't believe I only saw 25 patients today. Yeah, I finished my charting. It's a blessing. So I get to go home and spend time with my family. Maybe try and edit this video so I can get it up for you guys. But yeah, saw some COVID, saw some flu, had some other interesting stuff. I'll make sure to share. Hopefully it's beautiful where you are and you can get out and enjoy some sunshine and some fresh air. It's so good for the mind, the body, and the soul. I can't get enough of it, I don't know. I'm probably sounding like a little bit of a, a broken record, but I just love this weather. But until next time, I wish you guys nothing but the best. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll talk to you.